need those obviously as a a pro athlete i think people always like at least for me even myself when i try to like i look up like you know what's a pro athlete's training schedule or something and i think it's like you know 80 hours a week or something not to say it isn't but you need rest days right or else or else you burn out and everything no absolutely i think the most important thing is like for me honestly the summers are more time consuming just because like you're really laying down the foundation for your upcoming season in the summer, whether it's weight goals or increasing muscle, losing fat, whatever the case is, working on your game, your handles, your jump shot. And in season, it's like the most time consuming thing is just the practice thing. And like, obviously uh, lifting weights to maintain and obviously like the amount of games that you play during the week. But in Europe, it's a little bit different because we only play once a week as opposed to like the NBL, like they play sometimes three to four times a week, which is insane. Yeah. Yeah. After a season's done, how quickly are you thinking about like, you know, your summer workouts and, and, you know, prepping for next season? Um, honestly, I love basketball. So like, I mean, I think about that literally after the buzzer sounds after my last game. Um, and I just, so throughout the season, I always write down different goals and I like my percentages and things that I want to improve on, um, over the course of the summer. And obviously my summer this year will be a little bit shorter because I'm coming home a little bit later. Um, because So I was playing with the Halifax Hurricanes. Um, I went straight to the CBL. And after that, I went straight to Europe with Chan Romania. So I've been playing basketball for like a year and a half almost. It'll be two once I hit the summer, like straight. So I definitely want to take some time off this year just to rehab and recover a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, get back into it. <laughs> you know what? Obviously, you know, with the family like yourself or, you know, you and all your brothers are playing basketball. Like how much does basketball consume your life? Like when you're at the dinner table, when you guys have the off chance of all being together, is this just still basketball straight talk or you try to, you know, put the basketball to the side and, and, you know, just, I guess, enjoy life a bit more. I mean, we're, we, I mean, all of my brother, brothers are pros except for the youngest one. He's up and coming. Uh, he's mm-hmm. still in college right now and he's doing his thing over there. But I mean, it's funny because we're, the oldest brother was so much better than us growing up. Um, and obviously we've improved. So uh, the basketball talk is still there just in terms of like brothers competing at each other and talking smack here and there. But for the most part, we just kind of like, we'll sit down and just talk about life and just real stuff. Cause we're all older. Like I'm 27, my other brother is 28, my other brother is 25. So like, we'll just talk about things like, you know, like family and, you know, the right woman or, or building a house, you know, stuff like that. And also taking care of our parents, which is like our ultimate goal. It's yeah. uh, all of us make enough money that our parents don't have to work in the near future. So how much did, you know, growing up in a family of basketball players like you and your brothers kind of influence you, like help you, I guess, with your game, not only the physical part, but the mental part. The reason why I asked that is because there's like, um, I was listening to the Joe Rogan, <coughs> excuse me, podcast the other week and he had it, um, somebody on but they were talking about john jones the ufc uh late heavyweight champion and mm-hmm. he grew up in a family where like his both of his brothers ended up going to the nfl so they talked about like you know him as a kid like he would get in fights and stuff with his brother and you know that really kind of drove that competitive spirit for him did that you kind of have that same experience yourself growing up in a household full of brothers playing basketball um basketball to the side i mean we probably Honestly, we were huge WWE fans. So, like, okay. we literally wrestled and fought every day. My dad used to be a wrestler. He's from the Congo. He's actually a professional wrestler. So, um, uh, he loved it growing up and uh, it was kind of instilled on us. Um, but I mean, my elder brother, he was kind of like the the driving force for the rest of us to play basketball. You know, he was the star, he was like the top player in the country, uh, in his class and everything growing up. And honestly, basketball was my favorite sport. Honestly, I was looking more into volleyball and i also had a lot of interest in the military um it wasn't until because i didn't really play i didn't make any of my teams really i didn't play a real basketball game until i was in grade 11 um and i was behind my brother uh, we played for assumption in burlington and like we didn't i played maybe one game and i was one of those players to put this into perspective for you that if i made a layup the gym would go crazy so you can <laughs> You can imagine, like, you know, I was one of those guys. Um, yeah. But it was cool playing behind him and being on the same team as him. Um, and then I joined RITA, uh, Regional Elite Development Academy, uh, by Terry Upshaw. He opened up uh, that uh, program, and he basically said, you know, college takes for a guy, basketball, not a lot of skill, decently athletic. Like, let me pick him up. He took me there. Like, I'm surprised he even took a chance on me because I never saw pro basketball in my future growing up, never even thought of it. 
and something that never crossed my mind. I just always lived vicariously through my older brother. Uh, but then I, I gained a passion for it. You know, I had a lot of rough times, but I mean, I think him, seeing him on TV, seeing him pursue his goal, and obviously he played for the Wichita State Shockers the year. They went 35-0, and 0, and watching that and following the whole season well, for me was like incredible, and I just wanted to keep pushing forward. Yeah, because I know I was reading a bit of kind of your backstory. And, um, you had the article up on the, the northway.co, and you talked about how in, in seventh and eighth grade you were actually cut from your team for being too overweight. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of not a lot of basketball players that you know go on to play pro basketball, you know, get cut from mm-hmm. from the basketball teams growing up and everything. So that obviously must have been like a huge piece of adversity for yourself to try and get through, and probably helped shape kind of your mental, you know, your mental toughness when it comes to basketball. Kind of dealing with that adversity at such a young age. Yeah, it was um, it was uh, one of the more depressing times of my life because I dealt with uh, weight issues uh, growing up, and you know my brothers would would pick on me, and like it was like my older brother was really athletic, and even the one under me was very athletic. So like even we'd get invited to basketball runs, and I'd be like the last person that would be chosen. And uh, I wanted to play basketball in grade seven and eight purely because my brother was a star there, and I wanted to just follow in his footsteps. I got cut because I didn't take my weight serious. I didn't take my craft and the game serious. Uh, so I got cut um, from the team. And it's funny because in life, things come full circle. The coach that actually cut me recently commented on one of my um, Instagram pages. And he told me how proud of he was and everything. And he wanted me to come in and speak at the school, actually, um, just because of how far I've come. And that kind of like, Put a, little, put a little bit of a smirk on my face, you know, right. in a good way, just because it's like, damn, like, you know, really, if you, you know, I'm a big preacher on perseverance and everyone's path is different. You know, a lot of people, I try not to compare myself to others because I think, you know, God created everyone to, to go into their own journey. And uh, that was my journey. And, you know, to hear from a guy like him who cut me from the team was uh, pretty amazing, to be honest. Yeah. Was there kind of a bit of like, um, maybe like an I told you so attitude in your mind or like any sort of like, you know, you made the wrong decision growing up or kind of looking back, do you kind of look at things like, you know, everything kind of happens for a reason and, you know, maybe I didn't deserve my shot, I guess, back then, but now I'm a, I'm a different person. I think that, you know, trial and tribulation that I endured at that time, I think is what helped me not only become the man I was, but the, the player I am now. I think if I made the team, I would have took it for granted. And then they probably would have put me on the team because of who my brother was, not because of if I was good or not. And quite frankly, I was not a good basketball player at the time. I was really bad, you know. So honestly, he made the right decision. And uh, like adversity has become a rallying cry for me. Like everything that I do, um, anything that happens in my life that's like an adverse situation, I, I just welcome it. And that's helped me to get through really bad times, you know, and not revert back to things that won't help me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't regret. I don't regret it at all. And I mean, I'm actually really thankful for them for happening for that for happening because I think it helped me uh, moving forward. Yeah, your story kind of reminds me a lot of like Pascal Siakam's on the Raptors because he hadn't played basketball probably until about the same age that you did, like an official basketball game. He picked it up like pretty late in life, and then you know he put in the hard work, and then he went to get you know. Obviously, uh, they won the championship, and I think he was most improved player as well. And you kind of had a similar trajectory as well, where you started late, and then, you know, when you were at Cape Breton, you were, you know, the all star there. I think you were defensive player of the year, mm-hmm. like third or fourth in MVP voting. And I think it's a really important lesson for people to understand that, you know, I mean, this is in the context of athletes, but for anything in life, is it's never too late to start. Like, a lot of people, when you're probably like 16, 17, they would think no way he's going to go pro Like if he's just starting to play basketball now. But it's all about the work that you put in day in and day out. And you can pretty much achieve whatever you put your mind to. No, absolutely. Even when I announced that I signed with Cape Breton, because so my story is pretty unique. And I will always have tremendous love for Cape Breton University because so I had an offer from Cape Breton and some other schools. But Cape Breton was the only team that actually showed up to come watch me um, at a showcase I was participating in with Rita. This coach sat down with me and everything, showed me mad love, uh, Jim Charters. And um, Albany, uh, University of Albany, the Division One, also gave me a look. Um, and then what happened was I went on a recruiting trip to Cape Breton and I broke my foot uh, in a scrimmage. And I lost everything. Um, and I think I gained more because Cape Breton became a family for, for me. Um, first year was a little bit rough, but then Coach Matt Skin took over the reins of the 
of the team. And um, we won a championship under him uh, his first year, 19 and one that year. And he was probably one of the toughest coaches I've ever had. He just, he would push me and push me and push me. Like my hearing my name almost became famous in that gym, not for the right reasons though. Right. Um, him consistently yelling and push, pushing me. And I was a really shy, laid back guy growing up. And he kind of brought that dog out of me. And I really, he's someone that I always am grateful for and thankful um, in my basketball career, helping me to get to where I am. Um, so I just, I have so much love for him, but it was definitely a surprise for people. Even when I won the A-West Championship, people were just like, wow, because no one ever expected it. Even friends that made the team over me in grade seven and grade eight that were pretty good at the time were contacting me and saying, man, like your story is incredible. So I think, like you said, the lesson right here, um, growing up, I've always had a special place in my heart for like helping others, and especially kids. And I just think it's important to share your story because there are people out there that go through similar things. And I've read a lot of stories like mine um, when I was younger and those things helped push me when I was in darker moments. Um, but definitely like being here was, you know, being playing professionally in Romania, you know, I played in, in Holland as well. Um, just everything comes full circle. And I think, like you said, it doesn't only apply to basketball and athletes, just in life. Um, you might not get it on the Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, you know, you might get it the next Wednesday or the Wednesday after that or the Thursday after that. But I think if you keep pushing, then you know, eventually you'll get what you deserve, you know, in terms of the amount of work that you're willing to put in. Yeah. And I think, you know, you mentioned obviously you're in Romania right now. And, you know, growing up, you were kind of stayed in the Ontario region, playing Ham- Hamilton or Burlington, wherever it may be. So that's a little bit closer to home, obviously. So the travel might not be so much of a factor. But how much hesitation was there, you know, going out East to play Cape Breton because that would be like a couple hour flight away or even further going to Europe to play basketball. Like, was there ever that hesitation of, you know, I want to kind of stay closer to home and maybe this isn't the right spot for me? Or was it just kind of the thing of, you know, basketball is just my passion and I'll travel anywhere in the world to play it? Um, well, you know what? Growing up, and I'm not, that's not a shame to say this, I was, I was a big mama's boy. You know, I was very close <laughs> to my mother, you know, pretty, very close to my dad as well, but definitely a mama's boy. Um, so we have tournaments where I would leave. Like I remember one time we literally left, I think two hours away driving and my mom literally broke into tears. Cause like I was always at home. I was the fat kid that ate all the sweets when she was cooking and right. played video games. You know, my brothers were out running and doing what they did. Um, so when my mom started to see me kind of mature and start to be on my own, that bothered her a lot it was something she wasn't really willing to accept. Um, but I kind of, you know, I'm a very, very independent person and anywhere I can go um, to help improve myself and better myself and learn new things. I was always up for it. I was a very like, you know, intuitive kid and going to Cape Breton and being isolated because I mean, quite frankly, I love the school, but there is nothing out there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Nothing out there, you know, and um, going there really had to, it really tested my mental in terms of like, okay, really focusing and locking in and, and really taking uh, uh, care of my craft. And I mean, you know, Coach Matskin, you could ask him, I would come home every summer early. Uh, well, come to Cape Breton just to train like two or three weeks earlier, sometimes a month earlier, just to be with Matt and train because I just wanted to be, I wanted to be good. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to get back. And I also knew for me, it wasn't just basketball in terms of a lot of people do things for like pile and do things um, just for like attention and fame, whatnot. But for me, I understood for basketball, where it would not only where it would take me because I've always wanted to travel, but also the opportunity to be on a platform so my voice could be heard to uh, help other people. And I think basketball has given me the best platform so far, and I'm just hoping that it uh, it continues. Yeah, I always like to kind of like touch on the subject. You touch on a bit there, but it's like internal versus external motivation for like playing a sport or anything in life, but obviously in this context, playing a sport and you kind of mentioned how some people have that external motivation to play basketball, right? Like they do it for the money or the fame mm-hmm. or for the attention or for the hype or something. And then you have another basketball player, you know, someone more like yourself that has that internal motivation. They do it because they have the passion for the game. They want to inspire others. They want to help others out, you know, and that were maybe some of the situations that you were growing up. I think that's that goes a long way into you know the longevity of a basketball player's career and how much they enjoy it. If you're only doing it for money or fame, um, maybe it's just not the right thing for you, and that might be hard to admit to yourself. But mm. you know, that's why I think when you have important role models like you did growing up, like coaches and stuff, people like that can really kind of show you the ropes and 
steer you in the right direction because they've, you know, they've been through it all themselves and they're kind of giving back to the, to their community in a sense. Absolutely. And I think the issue with like chasing the fame, like the fame world, even Hollywood is so fabricated. You know, a lot of these artists, they have all the money in the world and things that they have, but you see a lot of them suffer from depression. Like the suicide rate is pretty high in there as well. And these are millionaires. These are people that a lot of people look up to and want to be them. But I don't think people realize what comes with fame. Like you got to have, you got to have a foundation. My dad, you know, preached this to us all the time growing up. You have to have something to fall back on. You know what I mean? And for me, that's always been my faith. And it's always been okay. Like this basketball game is, is, is bigger than just me and what I want. You know, there are little kids that actually are from the hood or from different places that actually watch me and watch the way I carry myself. I've had dozens of kids, hundreds of kids over my lifetime um, messaging me on Instagram through Twitter saying I'm the role model and this and that. So I'm very like aware of what I post on social media as well, because that's also very important, not only in the sense of like teams recruiting you, but who's watching you because kids are copycat. You know, they're basically copycat. They see what you do, what you post. And they want to be like you. So, so I'm always uh, trying to make sure that I'm putting out, you know, the right message to these to these children. Yeah. How taken back do you get, do you get when like someone messages you on Instagram and they say like you're they're your own model or something? Is that kind of like a surreal moment for you? Because I know like for me, like some people will message me about like maybe some of the podcast episodes I put out and it kind of, you know, like it kind of hits me different. Like when people, someone like actually takes time out of their day, like message, you'd be like, Hey, I really enjoyed when you said this. It's almost like a, like an aha moment or something, or like almost like a fairy tale. And we are like a dream. It's just so surreal. I find maybe cause I'm not used to it, but kind of what's your kind of feelings when somebody messages you as a role model? Does it seem more like a, a surreal moment? Like kind of like how I feel, I guess. It's definitely, it's unbelievable. It's surreal just mm-hmm. because see, I remember growing up, uh, my favorite player is Dwight Howard. And I actually messaged Dwight Howard on Twitter one time years, years ago and just told him something. He actually responded to me positively. And that was like huge for me. And I don't think Dwight, I mean, I've never talked to Dwight in person. Dwight probably doesn't know I exist. But I don't think right. he realized how profound that moment was for me and what he said to me. Um, and for me personally, I told myself, man, with the way he helped me with just that message, because this is when Dwight was Orlando, he was a beast, you know, yeah. best league, whatever. So I said, man, if a kid were to ever reach out to me, I want to be able to have that same impact on the kid that Dwight Howard had on me. So when kids reach out to me, it's it's still surreal every time because you think, man, I was a fat kid playing Lord of the Rings in my basement every day, right? Turning into this, you know, professional pl- basketball player that kids look up to. And you try, you're trying to get too caught up in the moment. And like I see a lot of people that don't take their time out of the day to help kids and give back. And also life is very short. So I think like what you do, you know, while you're alive is important, how you impact lives, because that's also a part of your legacy. Your legacy shouldn't be how much money you make or, you know, how much girls you got or anything like that. Those things are just like materialistic, you know, non-substantial things. So for me, it's like if I can help a life, I can also better the world because that life can help another life. So. Yeah, I remember like how you mentioned how you were tweeting at uh, or messaging Dwight Howard. I remember when uh, DeMar DeRozan got drafted by the Raptors and I tweeted at him and he retweeted me and it was like the best day of my life. And I was Mm -hmm. the biggest DeMar DeRozan fan for like five or six years after that. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, how you kind of you kind of touched on it a bit, but you know, basketball isn't really like the, the end goal for athletes, right? Like you, you can only play basketball for a certain amount of time and absolutely, you have to eventually look at life after basketball. And I think, you know, with the emergence of social media and stuff like that, it really kind of helps you or helps athletes create that personal brand or, or like they can market themselves a bit more. And just by, you know, responding to somebody in the comments or something, it can go like a whole, like a, can go so long you never know what it could lead to kind of thing and so that's why i always like hearing when athletes they you know they take the time out of their day to respond to fans and stuff like that because you never know a who you're going to inspire or b what kind of opportunities it would lead to you know for yourself absolutely absolutely definitely i think like it's funny because you look at the times of like michael jordan and a lot of these guys that played in the jordan era a lot of them went broke you know a lot of them had issues because I don't think financially, especially what they teach us in school, it wasn't as big. Now, like kids know how to save money. Um, even the way D1s, they prepare you more for the NBA lifestyle, for the glamour and the money. It's just much more um, out there now. So kids are kind of know what they're getting themselves into. And obviously, like everyone is their own person. You can still make a mistake. But I think this generation is much better suited 
to that kind of lifestyle. Uh, where back then they, you know, they definitely struggled. And social media is huge now for marketing for for a basketball player because at the end of the day, I mean, you're only going to play until you're like 35, 36 in the max, and that's what's like you got to be lucky to have good health care and stuff. And and I think after that, you got to think throughout your career, like and. It doesn't have to be when you're 19, 20, 21, but like from 25 and up, I think you got to look, okay, like where do I want my career to end and what do I want to do with it? Because you can make all this money, but if you don't know what to do with it, then you're going to be stuck. And that's why I think it's important to like, like I said, have a foundation and have like other passions that you have or some guys are done playing ball and they get into like the broadcast industry or public speaking or whatever. So I think, you know, those things are important. And like you said, like I remember I think Kuzma or Josh Hart made the tweet about Kobe years ago when they, one of them got drafted. And like that tweet actually came up in on draft night, like this is I think Kobe, and like that's why it's important what you put on social media as well, because especially, especially if you get to the NBA, you know where the spotlight's really on you, that stuff can come back and haunt you. Yeah, there's stuff you you know you kind of read it or see it all the time of people they'll go back and pull tweets from athletes from you know five, six, or seven years ago when they were in college or something, or you know I think there was that one um, NFL player that got drafted. Laramie Tunstall, he was the offensive lineman and there was like the video of him like hitting a bong or something like right before the draft and his draft like stock plummeted. It's just crazy like how much social media affects the world. And, you know, we talked a lot about the, the good of social media and as an athlete, how much it can help you. But there's also the bad part of it, too, whether it's, you know, posting something inappropriate or reading criticism of yourself. Right. Like. Somebody Absolutely. could be saying you had a bad game or something and you can if you place a lot of value on social media, you know, that can really bring you down and stuff like that. Have How do you kind of deal with any sort of criticism, whether it's on social media or not? Because I know kind of from your story, you probably dealt with a lot of constructive criticism growing up, whether it was in, you know, middle school or high school or, or university or now even the pros. Oh, I dealt with a lot of um, social media Um well, not just even social media criticism, because growing up, social media wasn't massive in my era. But mm-hmm. as I got older, obviously, it continued to grow. Um, and I had a lot of people think, say negative things about me. But I even look at the NBA, like you look at guys like Kevin Love, the Marta Rosen that actually suffer from depression. And like a lot of basketball players now, even like they'll post certain pictures and they will hide the comment section because they're they don't want to read. Like, okay, I'm not as famous as them, so, like, I'm not really too worried about people posting my comment section, but there's people out there where it really, really affects them. Um, so, for me, like, the way I just deal with criticism is, like, I just kind of take it. Like, my dad used to always tell me, he's like, don't listen to the tone of the voice. Listen to what they're saying. So, mm-hmm. there are some fans that are actually, like, genuinely passionate that don't know how to get it out, and they just say, like, the rudest thing, but they might be saying something that could make sense. You know what I mean? Um, right. Right. But even when I read it, but then there's also things out there that are downright disrespectful. But I mean, I don't really, social media is not huge for me. Like the only thing I really use is like really is my Instagram and I'll use Facebook and I'll tweet sometimes and, you know, I have the Snapchat. So, I'm, I mean, I have pretty much all of like the basic social media apps that people use in, in society, but I also don't allow it to define me. You know, I used to take, like I would call like a social media fast. I would like get off Instagram for like a couple of weeks or so. Because it can also be draining, especially when you're like in a critical part in the season, you want to focus. Um, but I think a lot of people get so con- con- consumed by it. And there's an old parable that says, you know, comparison is a thief of joy. And like, you know, even like women, for example, the way social media pushes what a woman should look like. And you see all these girls go through depression and stuff and don't feel good enough because of, you know, how other girls might look on social media. I think social media can be really good, but it's also... It, it can also be very dangerous as well. Yeah. When you kind of talked about doing like social media, like detox or cleanse or something like logging yourself out or deleting the apps, I kind of like to compare that to like um, how you mentioned when you went out east and there's not much to do there. So all you do is focus on basketball. Like when you just strip everything around, you strip all the distractions, it lets mm-hmm. you really uh, focus on it. And I know I like, it was funny how you mentioned um, how at east there's nothing to do because I have a buddy of mine that's... Um, currently doing some army training out east i think in new brunswick mm-hmm. um and they probably put the bases out east and like in remote parts of canada for a reason so that there's no distractions and you can kind of focus on what you do and absolutely you know, um and you probably kind of felt that yourself like when there's no distractions around you because in ontario there, there's so much more people so many more things to do when you're out east it's it's just you and basketball pretty much yeah definitely uh, roy rana he was a head coach of Ryerson at the time he recruited me 
Um, I didn't know too much about Ryerson. I was a little bit young and naive at that time. And, you know, right. I didn't think that they were a powerhouse. But, I mean, it worked out for me. We, we, won, a, we won the conference side when we went to Cape Breton. We also ended up beating Ryerson in preseason. But, you know, that's like in the heart of Toronto, you know. And uh, I knew at the time for me to get to what I wanted to accomplish because as soon as I realized I was getting recruited to play basketball, I said, okay, this is a real thing. Okay, now what can I do to get myself to that level? I mean, Cape Breton was intriguing. It was, also, it was also my first recruiting trip. And I also wasn't that interested. Like, I was interested, but, like, I wanted to get a recruiting trip win because Albany was my attention. Um, mm-hmm. But going there and seeing how it is and breaking my foot and just being out there, I was able to really focus on basketball. I mean, like, the only danger about a place like that is, like, they drink a lot. <laughs> that's really all there is to do. But it was right. nice. Like, the school was small. The teachers knew you getting off and pushing back test dates and things like that. We went on road trips. It was pretty easy. And, uh, it was, you know, our team was a family. And these are guys. A lot of the guys that I played with now are married. And I'm, I'm really good, close friends with them now, best friends. And uh, it worked out for me. So. Yeah, because um, was it all three of your brothers ended up playing, or the brothers played D one basketball? The ones that are uh, that have gone through the college. Yeah, they all went yeah. junior college and they all went Division one. So did that kind of like? Did you kind of feel any pressure to go to a D one college? Maybe you know earlier on in the recruiting process, just to you know follow in their footsteps and not be the only guy that didn't go to D one. Absolutely, and even when I did go to Cape Breton, and my younger one ended up going D one, and the other one did. Um, a lot of people looked at me and they were like, I had a, I had a pretty impressive college career. You know, I put up really good numbers, but I was like, it's Cape Breton. And I, I think if we didn't help make the team, like with our teammates, we didn't make Cape Breton like relevant at the time. I don't think a lot of people would have even been interested to see what I was doing out there, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but it was definitely pressure because watching my brother at Wichita, you know, him going on and talking about Julius Randall and, wanted to go at him and them being 35 and no one seeing my younger brother and my younger one now even I do one at Oral Roberts I kind of felt a little bit left out you know but I mean the end goal that I wanted was to play professionally so like I worked it twice as hard because at the end of the day the pros is they favor Canadians they favor Americans more because not a lot of Canadians were going professional just like not a lot of Canadians were going to the NBA earlier on but now it's changed so much you sports players you know, and it started, you see, with the, the Scrub Brothers from Carlton. You know, a lot of the Ottawa guys, Juan Ward, Johnny Bahamas, like all these guys and even guys in my conference in the U.S. have gone pro. And it's completely changed the atmosphere of how European clubs look at Canadians. And I think that there's a lot more respect coming from our country and uh, helping uh, benefit the younger generation. Um, so there was definitely pressure, but it definitely pushed me to work even harder. And um, the end goal that I wanted, I've, I've accomplished, so... Yeah, and it's really helped. I gotta imagine, like the um, the Canadian Basketball League, that was called the CBL, that just opened up. I believe last year it was, where they have a couple of teams across Canada, and mm-hmm. and I think it's the same as the the Canadian Soccer League, where you need like a specific amount of Canadian players on your team. I'm pretty sure, I might be wrong on that, but it's no, really right. really yeah. help. Yeah, yeah. So that really helps. You know, as as you mentioned, a lot of Canadian guys. Um, get overlooked when they're part of an U sport team because you know, they're from Canada. If they're not playing D one, like they just, people just assume that they don't have the same talent level. But you know, I remember, I mean, I don't, I'm not as much of a follower of U sport right now as I was when I was at uh, McMaster university. And I was like, you know, just part of the culture there and everything. But I remember some preseason games, like especially Ottawa and Carlton and stuff, they would play D one schools and, and beat them in the preseason. So yep. it's things Still like happens. that. Yeah, it still happens. Exactly. So uh, it's I'm really, you know, it's really good to see that the, the things like the CBL um, and just even more media exposure for youth sport and stuff like that really kind of puts um, these Canadian basketball players, their face on a screen and, and gives them the media attention they deserve because there's a lot of hidden and, you know, um, underappreciated talent, I feel like, in Canadian university basketball. No, absolutely. And like even like each CBL team has to have, I think, one or two youth sports players. I think it's one. So that helps the youth sport player not only be in like a professional atmosphere, but that can help him going back to school to have a better season. Um, and they're putting more emphasis on Canadian players because I mean, in America they have the NBA, they have their, they have a bunch of leagues over there. They have the G League, which is the predominantly over there. And then we have the Raptors 905 here. So I mean, 
the MBO, which is the one that's throughout the winter season, it's completely dominated by Americans. I think with the CEBO, there's still a lot of Americans, but they put way more of an emphasis on Canadians. And I think that's important because it's also showing a lot of our professional players that are playing overseas are now coming back. Guys like Xavier Rathen Mays, you know, Dwayne Notice, Mikhail McIntosh, uh, you know, have come back to play um, in the CBO and they would never play in the NBL, you know, like Michael Bongo, like, you know, these guys. So the CBO's, the CBO's talent level and exposure and just the way it's been carrying itself, I think it has been tremendous for Canada's basketball. Yeah, I know that you, I know you had some time in the, the Canadian League Basketball League um, playing with your brother, I believe, right? Was it um, was it in the CEBL you guys played together in the in the conference cha- or conference finals games? No, in Halifax was the NBL. No, NBL, was, sorry. My, yeah. Me, my older what, brother, CBL, all three of us played together. Oh, okay. What, what kind of, how was that experience? I know because, you know, growing up, you mentioned how um, your older brothers, they were almost like the role models to you, right? It kind of seemed like, you know, has someone would say, you know, Michael Jordan or, you know, LeBron James is my role model. I'm sure you would say my brother's my role model, right? You're kind of following their footsteps. What, how surreal was it to actually play a game, like a game of professional basketball with your brothers? I mean, growing up, I told everyone this, my brother was my LeBron James because right. he was the LeBron James of Canada at the time. He was jumping out of the gym. He was kind of, it was something that people didn't really see in Canada basketball that often. His athleticism was through the roof. Like, I remember he jumped over a guy. Um, he had LeBron's, you know, he had the build, he had the headband going on. He had the, the goofiness. Like he was, he was LeBron, you know, in Canada. And he got that comparison from many news articles and stuff. Um, and watching him and just being surreal by him and then like signing to Halifax and then playing against him. Cause he originally played for the St. John's edge, but then he made the decision to come over to Halifax to come join and play with me. So it was pretty crazy, but it also showed me my development because there were some games that I would play more than him, which is not like a, a hit to him, but it was more of like, okay, damn, like you worked hard. Cause I remember not even sniffing the floor and just being in awe of watching him play basketball. And in some instances, us being on the same floor together in a playoff run, you know, losing in, in losing by three in a game seven to the championship team that swept the finals. So that only sh- that showed us that we belong there, we can compete. And also that we lost a team that we felt like if we won, we probably would have won the chip, you know, and winning the chip would have been tremendously uh, amazing to do with my brother. But that experience is something that I will never ever take for granted again. Um, and I definitely didn't take it for granted. And even the summer playing with all three of them was just it was it was it was surreal. Um, something that, you know, you want to frame up in your, you know, living room one day and show your grandkids right. or, you know, we all show our grandkids the pictures and stuff. So that was definitely like it was un- it was unbelievable. Yeah. And, you know, we, we kind of talked a lot about the, you know, the, the glamour side of basketball, so to say, like, you know, playing with your brothers and stuff and, you know, really coming through adversity. But that adversity is such a huge part of basketball, like, you know, things that you don't wish to happen. And if, part of that is having bad games. And I know part of your article that you wrote for the Northway, you mentioned how in your last game at uh, Cape Breton, you only scored two points and you guys ended up losing to Acadia. When you have when you have such a. Um, a heartbreaking moment like that as a basketball player, how do you, what are the steps you take to kind of get over it and, you know, move on to either the next day or, or, you know, the next practice, the next game, whatever it may be. Well, I mean, I'll tell you two different things. Like in that situation, I didn't really have a choice because as soon as I went to my phone upstairs after the game, um, you know, being in tears and just flustered, I literally saw a message from, my um uh an agent that was about to go my coach and he said man i know it's tough i know you know you just lost whatever but we're very interested in you so like i kind of wiped my tears away i was kind of like damn like you know just lost a college basketball game my last one ever and the pro world literally right there you know so i kind of had to like you know pick myself up obviously give myself a couple days but i kind of had to pick myself up and go okay like this is in me check like you gotta you know this is what you're gonna be working for in the summer is what you've worked towards and it's here now, but like typically in a different circumstance, um, I always go back and I'll look at, you know, a lot of people look at stats for the wrong reasons, how much points you scored. For me, the stats that matter to me has always been my rebounding and my free throw percentage because I'm a player that I go to the line a lot. Um, and as a big man, you know, controlling the defensive rebounding can really change a game. 
And if I didn't rebound the way I should have, of we're being out rebounded, and especially me as a starting big, I really put that onus on me. And it was tough in K. Brent because, you know, I wasn't really, I was surrounded by a lot of fantastic players, you know. Um, Kenny Jean Louis, Cedric Castango, Seth Moa, you know, Keon Mares, I could, I could go down the line in my fifth year. Um, and the problem was that a lot of them weren't really shooters but against Acadia. They were like, some of they would send three or four guys and just, they just built a wall and probably one of the, one of the worst games of my career. And it was tough, you know, a team that we felt like we should have beaten and then back to the semis. Um, but I mean, I always go back and I'll look at what I could have done wrong. And I think film is very important to watch as well to see where you messed up. Um, and I realized the biggest difference that I made from then to now has been a change in my body. Um, I was always a very skilled player on the post, could score, had good touch. But the next level, you got to be able to be more athletic. Like, even here, like, there's a lot of plays where, you know, you look in the NBA, um, LeBron will drive. Sometimes the big will come up, and it's hard to make that bounce pass. But in the NBA, they're just going to throw the lob. You know, these are things I couldn't, plays I couldn't really make at Cape Breton because of my size, but I can make them now. Um, so it was just, it was an adjustment period for me. Everyone handles, you know, adversity and bad games differently. But for me, I just try to put things into perspective. Like, I have another game to get better, um, you know, another opportunity. And, you know, I want to fix those mistakes in practice. So, yeah. And I think the whole thing about, you know, the agent contacting you right after probably <laughs> what you feel like maybe one of the worst games of your, of your career when you only scored two points. Um, having the agent still contact you after, I think, is a really important lesson for people to realize that one game as an athlete doesn't define who you are. Like, if the, if the agent only cared about that one game, they obviously wouldn't have called you, right? But they're looking at the body of work that you had, and, you know, it's very clear that this is just an outlier game, and this doesn't define who you are as a basketball player, right? So I think that's a really important lesson for athletes to take is when you have a bad game, don't think that, you know, all of a sudden you're the worst player on your team or something like that because it's just it's just one game. Everybody in the world has one bad game at least, you know, every now and then. Absolutely. Very, very true. And that's something that I took into account and kind of put a smile on my face because it was like, damn, you know, one book closed and no one's opening. A lot of guys don't get that opportunity, especially like an agent to message you that quickly. So it kind of, the it, I think it helped ease the pain a lot. Um I mean, my coach, you know, Coach Matskin, we had such a tough relationship in college. We were very, you know, we, we better, butted heads a couple of times. Um, but, like, he was literally, like, you know, he's literally like my brother. Like, I love him to death. Um, and we really, you know, we really push each other. And we still have a great relationship. Um, even now, when I follow the team all the time, I follow their games and try to give him input and help some of send players to me to recruit, you know, to try to recruit for him and tell them the impact of playing with him and, you know, we've had two pros come out of his program, which was me and also um, my cousin Cedric, who also who was also on that team. So um, definitely, like the body of work is what interested him, you know. Um, and uh, you know, I was lucky enough to to get that message. So yeah, you know, the other the other piece of adversity that a lot of basketball players go through that I want to touch on were injuries. And you kind of mentioned injury, your in, one of your injuries, I guess, um, earlier on. Um, when you were kind of being recruited to to Albany and, and CBU, but I know throughout the rest of your career you had other injuries as well, like a like a, bul- a disc bulge in your back, um, fracturing your foot again as a pro. When you go through an injury, um, what's kind of your your mindset around that? Because I, for a lot of professional athletes, they obviously struggle with with taking time off from the game and dealing with an injury. They want to get back in as quick as possible. Um. So I went to Holland and right after college, I had a really good uh, rookie season. Um, I was like 12 and seven. And see, growing up, my family was so genetically strong and in shape that I never really took care of my body properly. I never stretched. I never really worked out the way I should have worked on now. Like my body, probably the best shape I've ever been in now. Um, so then with not stretching, you have to understand the older you get, your body starts to break down more, you know? And that was happening to me in Holland. There was some game that I played 40 minutes and caught the floor. And I don't think, I think I, I mean, in Cape Breton, the reason why my seasons were special, like I was averaging 18 in like 23 minutes some seasons, you know. Um, but playing 40 minutes was, and the pros was definitely a different animal. And, you know, the body gets tight, gets tight. And then I remember doing a deadlift and I like blew up my back. And I finished the whole season, but I finished it off 
basically taking an Advil before the game and Advil halftime, which was obviously really bad for me. And I was trying to mask the pain instead of identifying it and trying to fix it, which I look back now was like literally like just simply stretching out my hips and stuff. Um, and then the second year I came back and I just wasn't the same player. My explosiveness was diminishing. I couldn't jump as high as a lot of things that just weren't going well for me. Um, and um, I was, ended up being released from the team. And I, this is when I joined the NBA and I played for PI. And I ended up being like 295 at one point. I'm um, 295 pounds. I got into um, alcohol a lot. I drank a lot over there and I was like really depressed. And actually, the first game, I joined there. I broke my foot, <laughs> so it, it was just it was just really bad. And I was off for like seven weeks, and I put in weight. And and uh, I actually thought of quitting basketball that summer. I told myself like, man, I'm, I'm getting older, and like, I gotta really ask myself, am I gonna really take this game serious and and treat it like a pro? I look at LeBron, like how much money he spends on his body. You know, I don't have that much money to spend on my body in the summer, but I can definitely do little things here and there. So that summer, I decided to, I went to I went to a camp in Vegas by myself. Um, you know, paid my way, got on the plane, everything, stayed in the whole time by myself to go to this camp. And then that's how I ended up going to Halifax. Um, and I mean, one thing I preach now, especially athletes, is just to listen to your body and also your body's a temple. Like, your body's literally your moneymaker, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you don't take care of it properly, then it's going to backfire on you, you know? And that I learned that earlier on. And thank God the injury that I had wasn't like super substantial to the point like an ACL or something like that, which is like, can affect you. I think I've become a much more better athletic player now than I was before. Um, and like I say, it's never too late uh, to start, you know, especially with stretching. And that's something that I take into emphasis now and just little things to help uh, give me longevity. So, Yeah. Stretching is such, you know, it's, I feel like it's so underestimated by athletes, even m myself personally. I never really understood the full value of stretching until you get that kind of one injury that kind of is like that aha moment in your head. Like I had something similar where I I was deadlifting and I, you know, hurt my lower back pretty, pretty badly. Um, and I had like pain shooting down my leg and all that kind of stuff. And it really opened my eyes on how important stretching was because I specifically remember that day. I'm a, oh, I'm a huge Green Bay Packers fan and they were playing a Thursday night against Chicago and I was running late. I wanted to catch the game. So I didn't do like my typical warm up like stretching routine, went straight into deadlifts and just busted my back up. So that was my big aha moment. Like, you know, stretching is, is so key for an athlete and not only physically, but mentally as well. When you do stuff like yoga, um, and just really like long periods of stretching, if you're able to do it the way it's properly supposed to be done, it's almost like going out east to play basketball, right? Like you're removing all the distractions. You're letting your mind calm down. It's just you and the task in front of you. So that's something that I hope that a lot of athletes kind of pick up on as they, you know, at an earlier age than, than someone like I did is the importance of stretching, not only physically, but mentally as well. No, definitely. And, for, and it's not even just stretching. It's also like eating and sleeping. Like when I was 19 and 20, okay, I could eat everything. You know, I was a big kid. Nothing really affected me. I could eat a Big Mac before practice and practice well. Now, if I eat a Big Mac before practice, I might be out for two days. You know, like, yeah, yeah. It's crazy how, like, the body works as you get older and you got to take more time and, and care, you know, of your body. Um, and sleeping too. Like, like in college, I would stay up five in the morning, go to practice at fault four, like, things like that. But now it's like I'm an old man now. And it's like, yeah. you know, when you go to bed, um, you have to go to bed at a good time to have the energy and to have the strength. Like, there's a lot of things that go into being a pro athlete, and that's why it's not everyone is chosen. It's a, it's a special group. It's a special, you know, group of people that are willing to make that sacrifice and, and being away from home. And it's definitely because the, with the NBL, it's a very up and down game. It's a little bit of chaos. Um, most guys can do whatever they want, but in Europe, it's very structured. So it kind of exposes even talented players to see if they're able to play into a system, and if they can play a brand of basketball that if they take away your strengths, what can you go to as a counter, you know? Um, and that's something I learned quickly in my first year. I was so right-handed dominant at, at Cape Breton that when I came to Europe, they literally sat on my right hand and I couldn't do anything. So, you know, developing a mid-range jump shot, a left hand, um, spin move, and even like offensive rebounds is a great way to get points as well, putting pressure on the defense. And these are things that I had to learn over time, so. 
Mm. Listen, man, I know it's I know it's kind of getting late in in, uh, in Romania out there, so I don't want to take too much more of your time. But no really appreciate you kind of you know taking some time on your off day here to kind of share your story and some of the mental struggles that you know you went through as an athlete and how you overcame them. For those that kind of want to check you out on social media, because I know that you're you post a lot of good content on there. Um, what are some of the, your Instagram handles um, so people can um, check you out if they want to? Um, well, my Twitter handle is Extend Belief, but it's, instead of EX, it's X T E N D, uh, and, and then Belief. Uh, that's my Twitter. And my Instagram handle is um, Lufilmi, and it's L U F I 1 E. Instead of the L, it's a 1, and then M E. So that's probably the easiest way to contact me and check my content. As you, like, I, like you said, I try to post um, a lot of inspirational, positive things more on my Instagram, Twitter. I really use it to like follow sports networks and catch up with things and game to game updates. But um, Instagram is really like the place that I post post most most of my inspiring things. Yeah, I wish I had a cool name like that. You know, some name like Adam Carter. It's so hard to come up with like a catchy Instagram username or something that's clever like that. So no, just, definitely. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got it from my older brother um, during his uh, his crazy run at Wichita. There was a thing that came on. I was like, "Can you feel me?" And then like one of the fans said like. Uh, you feel me like you know with our last episode. <laughs> it was pretty cool to see that yeah so. 